July 1981. President Ronald Reagan named Sandra Day O'Connor as the first woman to serve on the US Supreme Court. Nintendo released Donkey Kong, featuring the debut of their future mascot, Mario. The civil unrest that had been bubbling in Britain since the Brixton riots in April came to the boil with new riots in Handsworth, Chapeltown and Toxteth, among other places. The specials topped the charts with Ghost Town, a song decrying the state of the inner cities. Folk singer Harry Chapin, best known for his hit Cats in the Cradle, was killed in a car accident. On race day, a walkway at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Kansas City collapsed, landing on a tea dance being held in the lobby and killing 114 people. The collapse has become a case study for engineering students to this day. In France, a new text-based online service named Minitel was launched, allowing users to make online purchases, reserve train tickets, send electronic mail, and chat live with other users. From 1982, terminals would be given out free to encourage use, and the system was popular and widely used until the advent of the World Wide Web, and was finally discontinued in 2012. Other countries experimented with the system, but without free hardware it never caught on anywhere else. There's a link to a great video on the system in the card on top of the screen. There were some innovations in the pit lane too, as several teams brought along revised cars, most notably Brabham, who debuted their new BT50 chassis with a BMW turbo engine. The original idea was that PK, stretching the rules rather, would qualify in it, then switch to the more reliable Ford-powered BT49C for the race. However, it actually turned out the new car was slower than the old one, so the team just reverted to that. Lotus, meanwhile, had brought along the 88B, a revised version of their controversial chassis they hoped would be acceptable. The RAC stewards okayed it, and the cars took part in Thursday practice, but a protest from Ferrari, Alfa Romeo and Ligier was upheld by FISA, and the team had to scramble to convert the cars to 87s for Friday qualifying. The British Grand Prix traditionally took place on a Saturday. In the end, they managed to do one, which went to team leader De Angelis, leaving a disappointed Mansell to miss his first home Grand Prix. It had also been an interesting test case in the new Concord Agreement era. The RAC had assumed that as track owners, they had the final say over entries at their own Grand Prix. The FIA demonstrated that this was not the case. Incidentally, due to a quirk of British law, no tobacco sponsorship was allowed on cars, so McLaren and Alfa Romeo covered up their Marlboro logos with stickers, while Lotus arranged replacement sponsorship from Brewery Courage. With Gitan not being available to buy in the UK, Ligier were just fine, but the race itself was sponsored by Marlboro, so there were plenty of the offending logos present at the circuit, and therefore on live TV. Elsewhere, Ozello were back up to two cars, but the luckless Giorgio Francia was out, replaced by Jean-Pierre Jarrier, last seen filling in for Jabouille at Ligier earlier in the season. On the tyre front, Goodyear relented on their initial two-teams-only policy and agreed to supply Lotus, not that it did Collins' boys much good, while Arrows secured a Pirelli contract which would help Patrese, who was good at using tyres and suffered from having bad ones in France. Silverstone is a power circuit like Dijon, and the Renaults were on song here too, claiming their first front row lockout of the year, both drivers clocking an average speed of over 148 miles an hour. PK and a much improved Peroni were on row two, with the two McLarens of Watson and De Cesaris going well again to line up on row three. Jones, Villeneuve, Reutemann and Patrese also made the top ten, and further back, the Ligiers could only manage 14th and 15th after having problems with their wheel bearings all weekend. Brian Henton looked like he might have a home debut after finishing Thursday practice 21st in a revised car, but then he crashed it and had to use the old one to qualify, missing out once again. He would join Salazar, Warwick, Gabbiani and a fed-up Mansell in the paddock on race day, with Borgood and Jarier Zazella making the grid on this occasion. John Watson would therefore be the only British driver of the four entered to make the race. The field got away cleanly, with Prost out dragging Arnoux to take the lead, and Peroni squeezing past his compatriot to take second, followed by Villeneuve, while two cars dropped out before the end of lap one, Alboreto going slow with a slipping clutch, and Stor throwing it into the kitty litter. Prost pulled away, and an entertaining battle for the next few places developed, with Peroni, Villeneuve and Arnoux scrapping over second through fourth, with PK, Jones and the McLarens following closely behind. Arnoux swiftly disposed of the Ferraris, getting back up to second by lap three, and also began to swiftly pull away, trying to make inroads into Prost's seven-second lead. As the leaders came round to finish lap three, Villeneuve lost the back of his Ferrari and skidded off into the catch fencing, collecting Jones on his way, while behind him, De Cesaris swerved to avoid the accident and ended up in the wall as well, 
Not his fault for a change. Watson managed to somehow emerge from the cloud of tyre smoke and dust intact, while Villeneuve got going again with the trashed car and tried to get it around to the pits before giving up. All of which left Reutemann and Andretti now fifth and sixth behind Peroni. The Ferraris had plenty of power, but the chassis couldn't put it on the road, effectively, and Peroni now had Reutemann breathing down his neck in the lower power but more nimble Williams. On lap 12, Piquet had a tyre blowout that sent him straight on into the barriers, and with the front right wheel impacting the monocoque, he was lifted out by the marshals with ankle injuries. This promoted the peroni reutemann fight to one for third, while Watson had got ahead of Andretti and was bearing down on the pair of them. Watson was clearly on a charge, getting past both Reutemann and Peroni in short order, to the delight of the crowd, at which point the Ferrari's turbo went foot and Peroni pulled off. The drama wasn't done yet though, because on lap 16, Prost pulled in from his commanding lead with a misfiring engine. It couldn't be fixed and he was out, so Arnoux took the lead with Watson now second. It was only lap 18 out of 68. Arnoux now had a huge lead of some 25 seconds and could afford to ease off a little to preserve his engine. De Angelis had done very well to get his Lotus up to 6th place, but he'd done so by passing Lafitte under yellow flags and was black flagged. He was not happy about it, and neither was Colin Chapman. Colin Chapman, why has Elio De Angelis come in? I really, I, it's no, nothing ever, I've never known this happen before in motor racing. Apparently he was black flagged because they felt that he didn't respect a yellow flag about 10 laps sooner. Uh, but normally, of course, if you're going to black flag a car, you get the team to do the black flagging. And only then, if the team doesn't black flag, then the stewards do it. I've never heard of this before. I just can't believe it. I, there's no way he should have been black flagged on the start line like that. Well, surely what normally happens is you have a minute's penalty, isn't that right, Colin? No, normally it's an admonition. They slow the car down, talk to him, tell him he's been a naughty boy, and then let him go. Not make him exclude, exclude him from the race like this. That's crazy. Colin, I have to say, it hasn't been your weekend, has it? You can say that again. <laughs> the race organisers had briefed drivers and teams before the race that yellow flag violators would be immediately disqualified, but Colin apparently missed the memo while dealing with all the other goings on. That left 13 cars on the track before half distance. Arnu led Watson now by about 26 seconds, with Reutemann another 12 behind in third, and Andretti and Patrese fourth and fifth. Lafitte was briefly restored to 6th, though he lost his place to Rebacca shortly afterwards. Chiva was 8th in the Tyrrell, Sierra 9th in the Theodore, Borgood 10th in his yellow ATS, Rosberg 11th in the Fittipaldi, and Daly's March 12th, with Jarier Zazella still circulating several laps down after having to come in to fix his rear wing. Perhaps thankfully for the prospects of having anyone finish, things settled down after that as everyone settled in to clock off the laps. Patrese reeled in Andretti and overtook him for fourth, and Rebacca lost sixth when he had to come in for new tyres, so Lafitte got six back once again. Rebacca came in for tyres again on lap 50, emerging ninth just ahead of Arnoux, who lapped him, but couldn't seem to pull away. The note from the V6 Renault engine was sounding distinctly rough, so Rebacca pulled out and unlapped himself on lap 53. Arnoux had a 24 second gap over Watson who now put his foot down and started to close in to the delight of the fans at the circuit who could hear the Renault engine and see Andretti pull up and unlap himself too. Watson was taking three seconds a lap out of Arnoux while the Renault team were waiting in vain for him to come in and get the exhaust fixed. With turbo engines the exhaust is vital. No British driver had won a race, much less the British Grand Prix, since James Hunt in 1977 which is also McLaren's last win with Watson having taken the only win in his 117 race career a year before that. So the crowd went nuts as on lap 61 of 68, Watson got past and went into the lead, and if anyone noticed Andretti's Alpha pulling over with a sticking throttle from in front of them, they didn't care. With just four laps to go, Arnoux's engine finally breathed its last and denied him six points for what had otherwise been a fine afternoon's work, promoting Reutemann into second and Patrese to third, until the Arrows engine also gave up the ghost. John Watson kept it going for two more laps to take a popular win, with Reutemann cruising to a valuable six-point haul in second place and the only other man on the lead lap. Lafitte inherited third after a quiet afternoon in an underwhelming car, Chiva was fourth, Rebacca fifth, and Slim Borgood picked up his first career point in sixth place. Derek Daly and Jean-Pierre Jarrier were the unlucky two to finish but not score, though it was the first time an Azella saw the chequered flag this year, and beat their only previous finish, the 12th, in 1980, so the team were happy enough. 
With Jones, Pico and Villeneuve all out, Reutemann and Williams extended their championship leads, while McLaren pulled ahead of Renault into fifth place in the constructors' table. Meanwhile, designers from all of the teams took note that this was the first win for a car with a fully carbon fibre chassis. 